Greetings, everybody. This is Dan Gardner. And on behalf of Pegasus Logistics Group, I'd like to welcome you to today's live broadcast entitled Doing Business in Mexico, Best Practices for Supply Chain and Logistics Professionals. We have a busy agenda this morning, so we're going to get down to work rather quickly. But before we do that, uh, Dennis Stanley from Pegasus is going to offer a few words of welcome. Go ahead, Dennis. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar series on doing business in Mexico. Uh, in the midst of this pandemic, some of the great things we've seen is a renewed focus on knowledge sharing. And at Pegasus, we really pride ourselves on connecting all of our stakeholders for collaborative dialogue and learning. And one of the ways we've stayed connected is to bring thought leadership like Dan Gartner in for shared learning. Specific to Mexico, here at Pegasus, we continue to see clients increasing activities in Mexico or strategically evaluating Mexico as a nearshoring option. The pressure to mitigate risk is at an all-time high for every supply chain. Dan is going to walk us through the advantages of doing business in Mexico. As you've read in his bio, his experience and his expertise is robust to say the least, and we're really excited to have him join us today. Lastly, I want to thank all of our client stakeholders for supporting our incredible growth as an organization. In 2019 alone, we saw a dramatic increase in Mexico activity, resulting in over 9,000 shipments, not including our warehousing. We cannot deliver opportunity to our great stakeholders without all of your support. Take it over now, Dan. All right. I, I also see that, that Hiram EVP of sales is on. Hiram, would you like to offer a welcome as well? Yeah, welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? You're good. Awesome. Yeah, we just, uh, to Dennis's point, we appreciate everybody getting on here. Um, you know, we want to drive a learning environment, and obviously the current state of uh, the pandemic has kind of limited our ability to get together. So we wanted to start this webinar series to really just try and connect folks learn together and uh, hope to have future dialogue on some of these great topics we've got. So um, we're super excited to have Dan. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge specific to Mexico and Latin America, and uh, we're going to let him take it away. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered to be here. have a great deal of respect for the organization, and we have a good lineup today uh, and quite a few people online. So from an administrative perspective, because we have so many people online, we're going to keep the mics muted, but you can write your questions in. I will see those as they come in and try to answer them. Uh, you'll also have an opportunity after the fact if you think of of questions and such. So we will address them as we count, as we go. We'll leave some time at the end. We have 60 minutes allotted. We might go over a minute or two, but that shouldn't be a problem. And then the final administrative note, Hiram and the team will reach out to people regarding copies of the, the presentation, uh, links to the recording, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks for attending and let's, let's get the show on the road, as they say. As far as the agenda goes, it's a, it's a brisk one. And as, as Hiram mentioned, a lot of the interest in Mexico, with whom Mexico has had a free trade agreement with the US and Canada since 1994, but a renewed interest, of course, is all around China and different opportunities outside of China and looking at Mexico, et cetera. We'll talk about Mexico within that general framework. To start with, we'll go with a brief history, a very brief history of the evolution of US trade with China, kind of a how did we get to where we are today slide. We'll talk about the China plus one sourcing strategy. If you're not familiar with that terminology, not to worry, we'll, we'll clarify it shortly. And then within that bigger framework, we'll start focusing on Mexico from both, both an import and export perspective. It's important to point that out. You can be buying in Mexico, you can be selling into Mexico, or you can be doing both. We'll, we'll take that multi-perspective viewpoint. We'll move on to geographic profile and industrial concentration. Just an amazing country for, from all perspectives. Talk about logistics infrastructure, transportation and customs considerations. We will provide a review of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which goes into effect July 1st of this year, offer some best practices for vetting suppliers if you're sourcing in Mexico, as well as for customers if you're selling into Mexico, and then finally some thoughts on what the U.S. approach might look like to global trade in a post-2020 
coronavirus, coronavirus world. As I said, you can write in your questions at any time. If you think of questions after the fact, you can write directly to your contact with Pegasus and we'll get back to you with answers. All righty, a brief history of U.S. trade with China. The, the actual, uh, the state, the country of China uh, in modern day terminology came into, came into being in 1949. We're not going to go all that way back. We're going to go to the first really monumental moment in the development of trade with China when President Nixon over here on the right visits China, Mao Zedong in 1972. From there, dialogue continued and such. Diplomatic relations began to take hold. But the big deal came around in our second bullet point, who was then the paramount leader in 1978, a gentleman by the name of Deng Xiaoping. And that's this fellow right here. This is actually a famous, famous picture of him because in 1978, China had, had suffered some major, major droughts, millions of people dying from, from starvation. And he made the decision that they're going to transition the Chinese economy away from a full dependence on agriculture to become the world's factory, export-oriented manufacturing. And that happened in 1978. And this picture of him was actually taken in Shenzhen, which is in South China, just over the border from Hong Kong, where, where the whole Chinese miracle, if you will, began. And it, it was literally part of the Pearl River Delta. It still is Shenzhen. But today, it's a bustling city of 10 million people and, and a testimony to the growth of China. From there, relations start in 79, bilateral trade agreement goes into place. That just means that people can buy and sell, mainly buy from China and import into the United States. Starting in the mid-1980s is when imports from China really started to hit stride. China joins the WTO in 2001. Trade with China, just to give you an idea, in 1979 was four billion. That's two-way trade, import and export. In 2017, it was 600 billion. We use 2017 because 18 is when the Section 301 tariffs, or, or more broadly known as the Trump tariffs, came into play and started to have an impact on trade. But forever, the U.S. pre-coronavirus had a 30 billion dollar a month that's billion with a B, a month trade deficit with China. Our imports were much greater than our exports. However, and this helps us to begin to segue into the Mexico discussion, China is actually America's number three trading partner. They were supplanted by Mexico and Canada, and they go back and forth between number one and number two. But one thing's for certain, China is America's number three trading partner. Mexico and Canada, they bounce back and forth between number one and number two. I think that's the first statistical indication of just how big and important the Mexican market is. Let's move on. You'll note on the right, a map of China. We'll make reference to it in just one second. But long before coronavirus, certainly before the Section 301 Trump tariffs came into place, over the years, and I'm talking from the mid-80s onward, it's just become more expensive to manufacture goods in China, which in turn makes it more expensive for U.S. importers to buy there. That's related to raw materials, pressure on labor, wages going up, and then equally important, industrial real estate in coastal China, because the whole thing, the whole Chinese transition to become the world's factory started down here, the Pearl River Delta, Guangdong Province, and then spread up the coast. Here's Shanghai, all the way up to Beijing, the ocean port of Tianjin. As you might imagine, coastal real estate anywhere is expensive, so it became more and more expensive. And companies that were previously in coastal China are moving westward, places like Chengdu, Chongqing, etc. It was getting more expensive before the Section 301 tariffs. In 2018, the tariffs came along, made it more so, essentially making Chinese exports less competitive because the duties were so high coming into the United States, 25% tacked onto whatever the existing duty was. Have a couple of, of a question here. We'll come back to it in just one second. This, this looks like a good one. Just a second, please. <clears throat> and it's related to the Section 301 tariff. So let's have a, a look at this and then we'll come back to that question. After the Section 301 tariffs in, in 18 started, 
of course, the 2020 pandemic reveals to, to America in general, not just people working in imports or exports, but a dependence on Chinese imports. So let, let's go back to this question. Just one second, please. Okay, I'll read it verbatim. Section 301 exclusion extensions, some were granted, some were not. Do you have any insights as to why exclusions were granted? PSC to be filed and duty recovered all the way back to July 6th, but now even after petition and extension, the extension is denied. And there's a specific HTS number. We can certainly look into that after the fact, but I think the general answer is without getting into that HTS number, and again, we'll be happy to, to talk about this offline, is that there was a certain amount of time for exemptions, uh, especially people in steel and aluminum. But the time it just basically ran out and they got tired of giving extensions because the, the thing about, and this is just a, an opinion, the, the thing about the, the tariffs is, is that initially the US importer pays those tariffs and tariffs are a source of revenue for the for the for any country, not just the United States. So there might be something to do with that as well. But I would suggest, as it relates to protests and such, if you'd like to discuss this offline, for your and I won't say the HTS number, but uh, I'm, I'm familiar with that chapter, we, we can certainly do that and have a more robust conversation. Thank you for asking that. Okay, let's move on. The China plus one strategy. Th this is... It's interesting because I've been around and, and in this business long enough to remember that China plus one, and, and to clarify, if you've not heard the term before, it's a sourcing strategy, meaning a US importer's strategy about what countries it's going to buy or source products from. And there, there's been a resurgence around China plus one. And I say resurgence because I can remember going back to the early 2000s when China started to get a little bit more expensive and there were constraints on production and what have you, that companies, importers in the U.S. were looking for other countries to source from. That's where the name comes from. And what it means is, as we see in our second bullet, it's a product sourcing strategy, meaning imports into the U.S., whereby a U.S. importer continues to concentrate the majority of their imports from China, but is also simultaneously looking to buy goods in one or more countries other than China. It could be a China plus one, a China plus two strategy. It all depends on the importer. But essentially, it means other suppliers in one or more countries. And examples of that, and that's been clearly seen, include Southeast Asia, and we're talking Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, with whom the United States has a, a free trade agreement, Philippines, etc. But definitely Mexico. That's what China plus one is. Why did it start or where did it start? And having been an observer of this as, a, as someone working in the industry can, can attest to how this proceeded. China plus one, it began in labor intensive industries like wearing apparel and footwear. Wearing apparel and footwear, labor intensive, typically a lower, not low, but lower unit price compared to other industrially manufactured products. As labor gets more expensive, and labor is the biggest component, obviously, Chinese products become less competitive. It's definitely started in apparel and footwear, but has extended into other verticals like consumer electronics and automotive, which by no coincidence are very strong industries, very strong verticals in Mexico. Just double checking to see if we have any other questions. I think we're good for the moment. Okay. Within that framework, why Mexico? And I want to point out, because one of the things that we want to do today is provide you with other resources that you can use to kick off or continue your market research as a seller into Mexico, as a buyer from Mexico, or both. And one of the resources, and we'll show an excerpt in just a second, believe it or not, and you may or may not have heard of it, it's called the CIA World Factbook. And yes, it is that CIA. It's from the Central Intelligence Agency, but it's available to the public. It's available online. And basically, and again, we'll show a, an excerpt in just a second, but it provides country profiles from infrastructure to population, demographics, telecom, power infrastructure, just a really good place to start to learn, not just about Mexico, but other countries 
as well. And, and I have to confess that, that I actually fell upon this some years back when my, my own kids were little and helping them with book reports. And one of them was doing a book report, it's probably TMI, but we'll throw it out there anyway, on Colombia. Uh, my kids are half Colombian. And I did a Google search and stumbled upon the CIA, CIA World Factbook and it's just a great tool to use. And we'll show an excerpt in the, the website and all that stuff in just a second. But why, why, por qué México? Why, why Mexico? Well, number one, it's the 15th largest economy in the world at 2.5 trillion GDP. That's where these, these facts are coming from, obviously, the CIA World Factbook. Big market. Population, 130 million. That's 10th largest in the world. Substantial, substantial market. Also, third bullet, a diverse industrial base, meaning there are different products that can be sourced or sold into, sourced from or sold into Mexico. Agriculture, huge with between Mexico and the U.S., Canada too. Food products, meaning finished products that we can buy in our local supermarkets or online. That wearing apparel and footwear for sure. Automotive, huge automotive business. Consumer electronics, chemicals, et cetera. A good diverse industrial base. It has a competitive cost structure. And when we say cost structure, we're talking about sourcing in Mexico where the landed cost coming into the United States for a variety of reasons, shorter transit times, less expensive transport in some instances, certainly the USMCA free trade agreement. Competitive cost structure is, is an advantage of Mexico. I, we're not saying better than China, we're saying competitive with other countries around the world. And when you combine those things with that structure, with other factors like proximity to the US, it becomes very a very compelling and interesting market. Of course, we've had a free trade agreement since 94. NAFTA, that goes away. And USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement goes into effect on July 1. Proximity to US market. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we show a larger map of Mexico. And strong cultural ties. I, mean, I, I think of, of myself as someone, and I lived in Mexico for four years, so I will confess to a bias towards doing business in Mexico, but I've also been to China more than a dozen times. So I've honestly lost, lost count. When you think about the proximity and lead times and such, that's a very big advantage. But something as basic as someone who, who's traveled myself to over 50 countries around the world numerous times, it's a lot easier to take a three-hour flight from Los Angeles to Guadalajara than it is 15 hours to go from L.A. to Hong Kong. And that might not sound like much, but anyone that's been to China more than three times will tell you that the glamour fades quickly. And when you're on a 15-hour flight and watch four movies and you still have seven hours to go, proximity to the U.S. means a little bit more than shorter transportation lead times. All right. Let's start digging into geographic profile and industrial concentration. Again, CIA World Fact Factbook. Mexico, it's a big country. And one of the first things we have to focus on as supply chain and logistics professionals is understanding where we are, if we're selling into Mexico, our DCs, our factories, whatever, where we ship from, but also our vendors, because it is a very big, big country. 14th largest in the world in terms of land mass. Starting to focus a little bit, and we'll show a much bigger map, as I said a moment ago, in just a second. But the five largest cities, Mexico City's top five in the world. I think Tokyo's number one, something like 25 million, something pretty substantial number. But Mexico City at 21 million. Guadalajara, that, that's where I lived for, for four years, working in the logistics industry and traveled all over Mexico. So the Los Zapatillos, as the people from from the Guadalajara Jalisco state area are known I have a special place for me big city big time contract manufacturing in and around Guadalajara at 5 million Monterey a little further up north at two and a half sorry four and a half and then Puebla and Toluca we'll amplify this in our following slide are very big at 3 million and 2.2 okay this is an excerpt I threw this in early this morning just because again we want to provide people with resources this is that world fact book that I stumbled upon so many years ago. And he, you can see the, the site up here. But you literally, I, was, I couldn't remember what the site was, so I went in this morning and I just Googled CIA World 
fact book. This is the name right here. And all you have to do is click on the country you're looking for, and up comes the profile. You can see a one-page summary, some photos and such. This is the part we'd be interested in, in terms of understanding the country geographically, demographically, infrastructure, et cetera. You can see here, and you just click on, and the detail is, is just crazy. So some of the economic facts we got came from there. You can see energy infrastructure, communications, military and security, transportation, et cetera. Just a really good tool in general. So, so hopefully, uh, maybe someday if, if you're helping someone with a book report, you can use this too. It has great applications for, for business. Let's move on. Okay, we're going to spend a couple of minutes on this slide because I've always, I'm old school. I've been around for a while in, in international trade and domestic too. And, and I'm a firm believer that effectiveness in global trade depends on a lot of fundamental things, but one of them is geography, believe it or not, and understanding the geography as it relates to concentration of industry, as it relates to transportation lead times, where we are in the United States as a seller into Mexico, where we are, who we buy from in Mexico. This is really important because as we said, it's a huge, huge country. There are 31 states in Mexico, and they actually are called states, Los Estados Unidos of Mexico. So let's start on the border, of course, California on the left coast from TJ, Tijuana, all the way over to Matamoros that has a border with Brownsville. And I've been to both many, many times. That's 1,969 miles. So one of the first things we need to think about, and we'll see this in subsequent slides as well, depending on where we're buying and or selling from, where are we going to cross the border and how are we going to cross the border? By truck, by rail? there's ocean business into Mexico. So these are some of the basic considerations that come in place. As it relates to geography and industrial concentration, which is the purpose of this slide, there's kind of a triangle that has historically existed in terms of industrial concentration and to a certain extent, population concentration as well. And you can see the my cursor going from Monterey up in Nuevo Leon state down to Guadalajara in Jalisco, over to Mexico, Mexico City, but there's also a Estado de Mexico, Mexico State itself, and then back up again. Traditionally, let's pick a couple of industries to talk about. Automotive is an example. It's no coincidence that a lot of the, the business in and out of Mexico for automotive through what used to be NAFTA with Canada and the U.S. would cross in Nuevo Laredo. There's big rail capabilities there, big truck capabilities there and then down the central part of the country. So if you start from, let's pick Puebla, Volkswagen, this is public information, has, has a major plant with a campus to support a tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, Toluca, heavy industry automotive as well. But as time has gone by, moving northbound, Querétaro has become a major automotive center as well as a technology center, been there many times, San Luis Potosí, the last international trip I took before coronavirus hit was to San Luis Potosí. GM is there. BMW is there. And that continues to move north. Typically, on the left-hand side of, of the slide, as I mentioned, I lived in Guadalajara, and that, that wasn't a coincidence. I lived there because there was a huge concentration of contract manufacturers. The manufacturers that make anything from smartphones to tablets Mexico in the last 15 years has, has become a world leader in the manufacture of flat screen TVs. So a little more technological concentration over here. But one thing I noticed since I lived there, and, it, and it's been a bit, an expansion into places like Guanajuato, that's a, over here, Leon, Aguas Calientes. We actually opened up an office in Aguas Calientes to support the industry that was coming from there. So of course, there, there's a lot of border business, you might remember the terminology, uh, maquiladora. That, that's still around, but it's actually been, I wouldn't say morph, it's been folded into another program. That's re it's an, actually an acronym. It's Spanish. It's IMEX, I-M-M, M as in Michael, I-M-M-E-X. And that's the type of questions, especially if you're buying in Mexico, do the vendors you deal with participate in IMEX because it essentially allows them to bring in raw materials from overseas without paying customs duties and such, incorporate them into a finished product and then re-export them. That's something, kind of a side note actually, but it's called IMEX, I-M-M-E-X. 
and lots and lots of companies participate in that. But border business is different from deep Mexico business, but the concentration of industry, definitely along the border for sure, but down in these areas here. All right, let's talk a little bit about logistics infrastructure. <clears throat> I mentioned previously, it's a long border, 1,969 miles. I haven't traversed it from left to right, but as I mentioned, uh, from Otay Mesa, which is TJ essentially, San Diego, uh, all the way over to Matamoros, Brownsville, and, and many places in between, we have to know as logisticians, as supply chain professionals, if we're going to do business in Mexico, buying and or selling, we have to have a plan for where we're going to cross and how we're going to cross. More on that in just a second. A little more geography, four U.S. states share a border with Mexico, Cali, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. The biggest one, and I'm sure because Pegasus is headquartered in Dallas with offices all over the U.S. and operations abroad, that our Texans online are, are well aware of the, the geography. It's predominantly a Texan geography. If you look closely, which we will in a moment, New Mexico doesn't have a very big border with Mexico, which is kind of ironic because New Mexico, you know, Nuevo Mexico, you'd think their border was a little bit bigger. In any event, and this is from DOT and another good source, I didn't include any excerpts here, but if you're looking for good information, good statistics on truck rail, especially, it's the U.S. Department of Transportation. That's where this information came from. So we can see right out of the gate, truck is the predominant mode of transport. No big surprise there. Rail at 14. So truck and rail represent 85% of the transport ranking. Pipeline is 1%. Now vessel, you might say, well, why? What do you mean vessel? Why would there be ocean freight business? Well, there's some Gulf business, uh, for sailings out of Tampa, as an example, for merchandise coming down from Georgia, Mississippi, to be exported out of Tampa, Mobile, to get a sailing over to Veracruz or Tampico Altamira. We'll, we'll show a map of those as well. But don't discount vessel and air plays a role too. Obviously more expensive, but timely. Here are 10 border, border crossings. And I think this is indicative of just how big Texas's border is with Mexico because the top 10 truck freight border crossings, six of them are in Texas. The big one, Laredo with Nuevo Laredo. Actually, little little trivia here, the largest customs port in the Western Hemisphere, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo. Otay Mesa, that's San Diego, Hidalgo, Texas, Nogales, Arizona, substantial highway as well as rail access to the western part of Mexico from Nogales. El Paso with Ciudad Juarez, big, big, big crossings there. Calexico, that's Mexicali. That's about a two-hour drive from TJ. I've actually made that drive, too. It's, act, it's pretty cool, actually. Interesting rock formations there. Brownsville, Eagle Pass, Santa Teresa, New Mexico, just one in Del Rio, Texas. Again, we want to be focusing on or have a clear understanding of how we're going to take advantage of this geography to our best use, whether we're buying and or selling into Mexico. I just want to check and see if we have any... I think we do have a question. Yes. Could you please talk a little bit about USMCA taking place on 7120, seven, sorry, 71020 and what will be impacted? Absolutely. Actually, we have a couple of slides on that coming up. So let's put that definitely, we'll come to that. And, and as we go through those slides, if you have subsequent questions, we'll try to answer those as well. But one thing's for certain the, the US Trade Representative announced that NAFTA goes away. USMCA goes into play on July 1st, and there are some substantial changes, and we're going to go over those. So sit tight on that one, please, and we'll come back to it, and we can continue the conversation there. Let's see what else we have. All right, that's it for now. Okay, let's rock on. Just another visual to, to help people get a picture for, for our, our little geography journey today. These are border crossings. We mentioned San Isidro. That's essentially Otay Mesa. This is San Diego down here, of course, LA up here. There's that Calexico with Mexicali down into Baja, California. Nogales is a big one. We're just pointing out the big ones. Obviously, there's several here. But this, in terms of highway connections from the western part of the United States, I've been involved in logistics moves for quite some time. 
goods that are coming out of Southern California and driven down to Guadalajara, for example. And it, we'll show the highway map in just a second. But cut across here, cross the border into Nogales, full truckload, of course, you have to switch equipment and then drive down the highway system. You can't see it, but it's right down here where Guadalajara would be. That's what Nogales is very important. And they have a lot of rail capabilities as well. Here's that El Paso with Ciudad Juarez. Eagle Pass is a big one. The big daddy of them all, Laredo. And then Brownsville with Matamoros. Lots of different places. But again, look, just look how much Texas dominates that, that border. New Mexico has a little bit. Arizona's pretty big. And actually, California's not that big, that big either. But just a visual to give some ideas about crossing locations and such. I think we have another another question coming in. Oh, what equipment switch is necessary? So we'll, we'll get to that when we talk a little bit more about border crossing and such. But historically, going back to NAFTA, if you had a full truckload, let, let's for purposes of not oversimplifying, but a single shipper going to a single constant, you say a 53 footer. If you're trucking from the U.S. down to Mexico or Mexico coming northbound, NAFTA actually had a provision in it that allowed Mexican drivers to come into the deep United States and U.S. drivers to go into deep Mexico, but that was never honored, actually. So there was a, a requirement for a, a change of equipment, essentially a dray, once goods are cleared, across the border and then picked up on the other side by a U.S. driver in the U.S. or a Mexican driver on the other side. Now, can trucks go a couple miles in to do local deliveries and such? Yes. But when you say a change of equipment, that's essentially what we're talking about. All right. This is also from the US DOT, and it just shows a highway map. It's obviously the same map of at least part of North America, but what we're, we're, our focus is on green. So we can see the major crossings. These are major highway crossings, trade corridors with more than 40,000 annual trade, trade trucks. That Nogales piece that I alluded to earlier can come all the way down, Guadalajara. That's quite frequent, actually. You have El Paso, major right down through the middle into Torreon, Saltillo, can cut over to Monterey. But if you look at a Dallas, for example, through San Antonio, Nuevo Laredo, you can come down all the way deep Mexico into Guadalajara. And to give you an idea, and I looked online right before the, the webinar kicked off, let's say from Dallas, truckloads from Dallas down to Guad, that's 1,055 miles. And on MapQuest in a car, they're claiming it can be done in 19 hours. We, back in the day, we used to run trucks from Dallas down to Guadalajara. And if you don't have any issues at the border, realistically, you're, you're looking at three or four days, just to give you an idea of the, some perspective on, on lead times. But again, and this will be reflected in the rail crossings as well. The big, the big time ones are Nogales, El Paso, and Laredo down here. And we're focusing on the green. This is rail. This is a little blurry. I will apologize for that, but it was the best I could get it. This is that rail infrastructure, which is substantial. And we're talking about intermodal rail now, especially in the automotive industry. And as you can see, we had pointed out earlier that automotive, let's call it corridor, starting in Monterey, down San Luis Potosí, Queretaro, all the cities that we mentioned, you can see that crossing into Laredo. But the color is a darker a darker green. And believe it or not, if you look at our legend over here, that's KCS. That's the Kansas City Southern Railroad. And you might think, well, what would they have to do with Mexico? They, they just made, they being the, K, the KC Southern, made investments in Mexico going back, goodness, 20, 25 years ago that established them in this corridor and ability to make connections through other rail capabilities like UP in blue. That's what that is here. But if you look to the left, and this is all about interchange agreements, just, just like an airline airlines would have or steamship lines would have. In the more purple color, that's Ferromex. That's the Mexican Railroad. El Paso, Tucson, as we said, really mirroring that highway capability, connecting with the UP, with the BNSF, 
The point being that yes, truck dominates, but rail, depending on the nature of your business, is most definitely a viable option. It's pretty, pretty huge, actually. Let's move on from there. Take a look at some ocean ports, and I'm just checking our time. I think we're in decent shape time-wise. Top Mexican ocean ports, again, you might not think that Mexico would have a big ocean trade with the U.S., but here's Tampa over here. You get sailings over to Tampico Altamira. Those are two port complexes, kind of like L.A. Long Beach in terms of proximity to one another. The big one, especially into this area here, Mexico City, Toluca, Puebla, is Veracruz. The west coast is Manzanillo, which is more of a, a container port. And again, to give you an idea of, of drive times, for example, I lived in Guadalajara. We used to go to Manzanillo. We, we opened up an office down there, and there's actually some decent resorts down there, for, especially for a port town. You'd be surprised. In any event, in a car, and these kind of windy, little, little on the mountainous side, my recollection, driving in a car, three and a half hours from Guad to Manzanillo. Lázaro Cárdenas is a, is a port that has emerged in the last 15 to 20 years just south of Manzanillo and a lot of automotive exports leaving from there, especially Puebla and other places, actual automobiles and row row vessels going from there. So that's just an idea of the ocean ports. And here's the airport network. Black icon is Aeropuerto Nacional, that's a domestic airport, and then of course the international airport. All the major cities have, have international flights pre-COVID pre to get from, from LA to Guadalajara seven, eight times a day, no problem. Sa same with Dallas, even more, actually. The thing that's changed about Mexico in terms of, of its aeronautical infrastructure is traveling within Mexico, which becomes important if you're down there looking for new customers, looking for new vendors, et cetera, because the ability to get around you could always get around to Guad, to Monterey, Monterey, Mexico City. I, I used to do it all the time, in one day, actually. But now, a little bit different, is some of these places, like a San Luis Potosí, a Toluca, a Puebla, have their own airports, and you can get around quickly. As, as I said, the last international trip I took last year, I, I was in San Luis Potosí. What I didn't say is that I was in Vallarta before that. It was a pure coincidence but I was able to tie some, some family time in Vallarta. And I actually took a flight from Vallarta to San Luis Potosí. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. So it's a lot easier to get around within Mexico, which makes it more convenient when you're looking for vendors, visiting customers, et cetera. Good, strong passenger as well as cargo infrastructure. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> Buying and selling goods in Mexico. Some logistical considerations, really a summary of what we've been talking about thus far. But to enjoy all the benefits of sourcing from Mexico or selling into Mexico, we as U.S. importers and exporters need a clear understanding of logistical considerations. That's just another way of saying that logistics really has to be an integral part of your overall value proposition. I say this all the time to people, having a, a good product at a competitive price, it's not enough in international markets. It's the price of admission into the game. So to be able to use logistics to create competitive edge, reliability and lead times, accuracy of documentation, timely customs clearance has to all be part of your value proposition. Hopefully I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on that. Within that context, what are some of the things we need to think about? Some I've already mentioned. Number one, origin and destination locations. Where are we and where are our customers or our vendors? Because that's going to help to determine our crossing point. Very basic, but you'd be surprised that, that companies sometimes overlook this stuff. I, I've seen it more than once in, in my consulting endeavors. The mode of transport. Will we go truck? If we go truck, will we use an LTL, less than truckload service, which exists into Mexico? Will we go FTL? Will we go rail? Might we have to back, have a backup with air freight? You have to have all that stuff planned out ahead of time. What are the border crossing requirements? Alluded to a little bit ago, customs requirements and logistics requirements, border crossing, it's different in Mexico than it is in Canada, actually, as it relates to US MCA, having to change equipment. For, for example, if you sell into Mexico, you have to understand that your customer in Mexico 
tax to pay the customs duties before they get their merchandise. If you import into the United States, you know this, you get a 10 day grace period, it's called an ID privilege, immediate delivery, or you can go on periodic monthly statement. That doesn't exist in Mexico. It doesn't exist in Latin America, anywhere. Point being that you wanna be working with customers that are financially solvent and that can pay these customs duties up front. <clears throat> Obviously, USMCA offers duty-free status, but that doesn't liberate your customer in Mexico from paying VAT, for example, a value-added tax. That's just a little side point, but we have to be cognizant of these things long before the first carton or kilo or pound of freight gets moved. What are your lead time requirements? We talked about three days for in a full truckload, barring any customs issues from Dallas down to Guadalajara. What is it from Saltillo? What is it from San Luis Potosí? If we're shipping goods from Los Angeles and crossing into Nogales, how is it? How long is it down to Guadalajara? Is it that same three to it's about five days? But you know what I mean. We have to know these things ahead of time, and you have to be working with people in the three PL space that can provide you with that type of information. Not to make things perfect, because trust me, Mexico is far from perfect, but to minimize the probability of things going wrong ahead of time. Risk management at the end of the day. What are our Inco terms rules? Sometimes people think that Canada and Mexico, you don't have to use Inco terms because we're neighbors and we're right next to each other and all that good stuff. You have to know your Inco terms rules, whether it's Canada, Mexico, Europe, Africa, no matter what, I see this all the time. Companies figuring out Inco terms after the fact, meaning after goods move, and goodness forbid goods get damaged or they get stolen, or there's charges that no one knows who's supposed to pay. It's all about the Inco terms. So let me emphasize that point. Let's, uh, a couple questions here. What is the difference in challenges with Mexico customs compared to US? Let's, let's answer that now. It, it's certainly relevant and within the framework of what we're talking about. Here, here's the thing about customs in general. Every major trading nation in the world is a member of the World Customs Organization, the WCO, not the WTO, the World Trade Organization. As such, the customs entities within those countries agree in advance to, to follow the policies and procedures, starting with the harmonized system number, the first six digits of the harmonized system, to standardize trade practices. And an example, if a country joins the World Customs Organization, it's a non-governmental, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, Customs clearances have to be electronic. There's no way around that. They have to be electronic. So any commentary on differences between a Mexico and U.S. or Canada or whomever has to be within that frame of reference, if you will. One of the big differences about customs clearance, there's a couple now that you bring it up. In Mexico, if you're selling into Mexico to, to your customers there and they use a Mexican customs broker, the liability that Mexican customs brokers have in terms of the, the reliability and accuracy of an entry, a pedimento, as it's called in Mexico, a customs entry, it's actually on the customs broker. In the U.S., it's more on, it's not more, it's on the importer of records. So that's one major, major difference. And one of the reasons why Mexican customs brokers tend to charge more for their services relative to a U.S. customs brokerage fee because the liability is so high. As such, as the exporter from the U.S. selling to a customer, you have to know who your customer's customs broker is. Where are they on the border? Do they have an office there? What are their capabilities? How do we work together? You're the one, as the seller, that's going to be providing the commercial invoice and the packing list. Your third-party logistics company is going to be doing a truck bill of lading or an ocean BL or an air, airway bill. The involvement of a customs broker in any international transaction is really important. It's especially so in Mexico. The other big difference is that I mentioned already is that customs duties have to be paid up front. And that means as a seller into Mexico that you have to be working with financially viable companies. Again, that's pretty much alleviated, if not eliminated, if your products that you're selling into Mexico qualify for duty-free treatment under USMCA. The fact remains, that the transaction has to be taken care of in advance. And it's always important from a know your customer perspective to be 
have a clear understanding of what their capabilities are? That's a really good question. Thank you for, for asking that. Last piece here is transport component of landed cost. That applies to us whether we're an importer or an exporter. Everybody wants to know what their landed cost is, the, the sales price of the goods at the door of a factory in Atlanta or a door of a factory in Monterrey, the transportation component. No customs duties, hopefully, because we qualify for USMCA. But if we're bringing goods into the United States, we have to be able to, on a prorated basis, allocate transportation costs to tell us as an importer what our item-specific landed cost is. Same applies to your customer in Mexico. They want to know what that product is really costing them so that they can go out and competitively price it when they sell that product in the Mexican market or they incorporate a raw material into a production process that takes them even further down a cost and a cost accounting structure. Last piece here, nature of your goods. What's the value? Are they perishable? Big time agricultural and food and bear such trade with the U.S. and Mexico and susceptibility to theft. I will say, I think it is incumbent upon us to, to say that Mexico, great business opportunities, great place to do business. I, I have a, a, a commercial bias and a cultural bias towards Mexico. I will confess that. What I will also tell you is that Mexico, like any country, has its challenges. Supply chain security, as it relates to overland transport, truck freight, some, some challenges around theft of loss or theft and loss or damage to goods. You have to be cognizant of that. You have to understand the good and the things that can be improved upon. So to have a good supply chain security program in place, I, I, I would be negligent if, if I didn't bring that up in this in this webinar. And I, and I just love Mexico for a lot of different reasons, but we have to be objective as well from as supply chain and logistics professionals. Let's move on. All right, let's talk about the USMCA agreement and get back to the original question that we had from the gentleman earlier because we will come and talk about that. USMCA, and this is the official name, complete with dash. This is how it's spelled, the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, USMCA, replaces NAFTA, which went into place in 94, goes into effect on July 2020. What are some of the differences to address the gentleman's question that are going to be in place or what, what remains the same. Second bullet, and let's start our next USMCA conversation in a broader context, talking about any FTA. When we say FTA, we're talking about a free trade agreement. Whether you're dealing with Canada, Mexico, or any of the other 18 countries that the United States has a free trade agreement with, these rules apply. When qualifying a product under any FTA, importers and exporters need to focus on a number of key factors. Well, before we talk about those key factors, what do we even mean by qualifying a product? As the name would indicate, we working with our customer or our vendor overseas, depending on whether we're the exporter or the importer, have to be in a position to validate that a product was, was actually mined, fished, or harvested, or produced in the FTA region or the FTA territory as it's called, Canada, US, Mexico. That's what we mean by qualifying a product. An example of what wouldn't qualify, let's say we bought, we're an importer in Carson, California, not, not too far from LA Long Beach, and we bring in shoes from the Philippines. And those shoes were made in the Philippines, but we bring them in, we repackage them, we don't do anything to the shoes, and then we sell them to a customer in Mexico and say, well, they transited the U.S., that makes them of U.S. origin. Absolutely, positively not. A product, as we'll see in a moment, has to be fished, mined, harvested, or produced in whole or in part of materials coming from the territory. More on that in just a second. Within that statement, here's the thing. And this is the, the best condensed version that I could come up with in, in a short period of time. Know your six-digit harmonized system number for every product under consideration. You might say to yourself, well, doesn't the U.S. use 10 digits for the harmonized tariff schedule of the United States and for Schedule B for exports? Yes, we do. But free trade agreements, especially as it relates 
to the nomenclature provided by the World Customs Organization, they're only interested, they being the FTA itself, in the six-digit harmonized system. The U.S. definitely uses 10, but the last four are U.S. specific. The first six are globally recognized, and that's why we say six-digit number. From there, be able to find your product-specific rules of origin using government online resources. We're going to show you what they are. They are excellent. But we have to know if our specific product qualifies as what is called an originating good. That's how you do that. Be in a position to validate the certification of origin. You'll notice a difference in terminology if you worked with NAFTA before. Under NAFTA, you had to, the exporter had to provide a NAFTA certificate of origin. That goes away entirely. We'll talk more about that in a second, but it's now called a certification of origin, meaning that a good was originating in whole or in part in the USMCA region. That's straight up out of the agreement. And then hopefully you can manage the process in an automated fashion. This, this is what you really have to be doing to manage the process as either a buyer from Mexico or a seller into Mexico. A couple of resource slides, and I commend the federal government for the job they do in providing these resources to the general public. Anybody can get this stuff. But if you want to learn about free trade agreements and drill down at an item product specific level for any one of the 20 countries that the U.S. has free trade agreements with, you want to go to the USTR.gov website. That's the office of the United States Trade Representative. Our interest, of course, is U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. There's an arrow there for obvious reasons. But if we wanted to look at Peru, El Salvador, did you know that the United States had a free trade agreement with Morocco? You can click on that and see the details. When we click on U.S. Mexico-Canada agreement, this is what comes up. And you can see different parts of the agreement itself. These are hyperlinks that will lead to a PDF file. Our greatest area of interest in determining if our products, whether we're buying them in Mexico or selling them in Mexico, qualify for duty-free treatment, we want to look at Chapter 4, Rules of Origin, and Origin Procedures. The Rules of Origin provide product-specific requirements at a six-digit HS level, harmonized system level. And the origin procedures talk about how the NAFTA certificate of origin went away and how do you validate the or origin of a good, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to click on those and off you go. Let's see here. How, does, how to waive VAT when moving sample machine or demo machine from, from US. Yeah, that, that can be done. It's a special... Mexican Customs Regimen, rather a lengthy conversation. And I mentioned earlier, companies that are involved in IMEX, 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 and it's, a, it's an acronym, but it incorporates what used to be called Maquiladora, which still exists, but it's all under this umbrella of IMEX. And it allows for things like the importation of capital equipment without paying duties and potentially VAT. Because why? Because it creates jobs in Mexico. So getting back to that whole EMEX conversation, it's a much broader discussion, but yes, you can do that, and samples as well. If you'd like, we can take that conversation offline as well because it's a rather deep one, and but definitely can be done. This is the slide we want to for USMCA rules of origin and such. Let's move on. Finishing up on USMCA, and we're going to run over maybe five minutes. Hopefully, you will indulge me and, and stick around for, for the crescendo toward, towards the end of the, the webinar and answer some questions and such. But we, we, have some, we have some good stuff here. So please, if you can, please stick around. And by the way, because I have a panel, you see my cursor go over to this side from time to time. I have a panel, and I can see who's on and who's not. So please stick around. We, have, we still have some good stuff to do. As it relates... Wrapping up on USMCA rules and requirements, a number of changes and updates as it relates to not the certificate of origin, that terminology goes away. It's called the certification of origin, and that's all found in Chapter 5, as we see over here. This is just a smaller image of the previous slide. NAFTA certificate of origin goes away. The exporter, meaning a company in Canada or the U.S., or the non-producing exporter can prepare 
the certification of origin. What do they mean by a non-producing exporter? Well, let's say I'm a, I'm a reseller of product. I, I buy printing equipment from a manufacturer in Toledo, Ohio, and then I resell it in Mexico. I'm the non-producing exporter. Can I still provide a certification of origin if the product qualifies under the rules of origin? And we know that by looking up the six-digit HS number of that printing press, if you will, and it's based on what's called reasonable reliance, meaning that we as the non-producing exporter can rely on the exporter, I should say the manufacturer, for good information. Here's a big one. Importers may now prepare the certification of origin, and that's an importer in the U.S., an importer in Canada, and an importer in Mexico. However, when you look at the details of the USMCA agreement, Mexico got a provision in there that says importers in Mexico can't do this just yet. They have three and a half years, meaning the Mexican government, to create a structure whereby the importer can do the certification of origin. That's in writing in the agreement. You need to know that if you're a seller into Mexico and you want the importer to do the certification of origin, Mexico has three and a half years to implement that as of July 1st. That's an important consideration. But if you're buying from Mexico, you can do the certification of origin. But here's the thing. You have to provide the backup if asked to do so. And I'm talking about things like bills of material from your vendor in Mexico, costed bills of material. They'd be able, able to prove regional value content in terms of raw materials that went into production that came from the FTA territory. It isn't just, oh, make a statement on a commercial invoice and that's the end of it. You have to be able to back it up. You can actually put the statement on a commercial invoice and you can use an electronic format. Okay, let's a couple more slides here. Stick around, please. We're not too, too bad. Best practices for vetting suppliers and customers. Because as you know, we've been talking the whole time about scenarios where we might sell into Mexico to customers. We might buy from Mexico from vendors or ideally both. This is best practices in both scenarios. And this is a partial list but really important ownership structure. In the banking industry, it's called KYC. Not, not KFC, KYC, know your customer. And the same principle can be applied to know your vendor. Who are these people? How long have they been in business? Do they have references? Is it possible, maybe, to get a Dun & Bradstreet on a Mexican company? We need to know who we're dealing with because like in any country, not, not everybody is on the up and up. What's that financial stability? We mentioned this a couple times, no need to dwell on it. But is your customer, or your vendor for that matter, in good standing with Mexican customs? And that's called SAT. If you see that acronym, that, that's Mexican customs based. Well, yeah, Mexican customs and, and revenue collection, kind of like the, the IRS. What are the geographic locations of our customers and or vendors? We talked about this. There's a big difference between border business and deep Mexico. See if your customers, although it's not written here, if they are part of IMEX, I-M-M-E-X, that program where goods can be brought, capital goods as well, can be brought raw materials into the country, manufactured and re-exported. What do your vendors or customers, what do they carry in terms of a product line or what do they offer in a manufacturing environment? What's their production capacity? Uh, one thing we didn't mention and, and really should, again, in the spirit of objectivity, is the overall production capacity of a Mexico compared with China, it's just not as big. The Chinese economy is 14 trillion. The Mexican is two and a half. You have to look into, yeah, I can get a great product. I can move, I can go China plus one. You can get a competitively priced product in Mexico. How many of them can the vendor make? That's important. How many employees they have? Who are their raw material? suppliers. This is an important one because tier one, tier two, tier three raw material suppliers in Mexico still have a ways to go in terms of their own evolution. That's, that's something that you really need to be cognizant of. What else? Of course, unit price by item, whether you're buying or selling. What's the MOQ? Is there a minimum order quantity? I mean, this is getting down into the weeds now, but it's, these are important considerations. Any quantity discounts? What are your payment terms? If you're selling into Mexico, are you giving terms, stage payments? You want a letter of credit? And then, of course, demonstrated knowledge of USMCA.
You want to be working with companies that have their act together as it relates to the new requirements of USMCA. What else? General knowledge of Mexican and U.S. customs procedures, docs requirements, border procedures, etc. Logistics expertise. You and your customers want to be working with 3PLs, freight forwarders, and customs brokers that are on the ball. Stating the obvious here, but again, I, I see it all the time. And people put a lot of emphasis on, on product and customer service and such, and don't make logistics as big a part of their value prop as perhaps they should. It's a big deal. Supply chain security, already made a comment on that. You have to have that in place, especially depending on the nature of your product. Is it highly susceptible to damage and or theft? And then of course, compliance with talking about customers and suppliers in Mexico, compliance with any USMCA requirements on what is called CSR, corporate social responsibility. How do they treat their people? Are they environmentally conscientious? That's that's actually all parts of the USMCA. We didn't go into it today because it's it's a little out of scope for our purposes, but there's all kinds of provisions in the USMCA about labor, environment, and we have to be good corporate citizens. That's the way we'll all grow together. All right, two more slides, and I'm maybe, well, one minute over. That's actually pretty good for me. So almost done, and we'll, we, I'll stay on as long as we have commentary and or questions. The U.S. approach to global trade in a post-coronavirus world, this, this is speculative on my part, based in part on, on some statistical support, but nobody can predict the future. In fact, as of right now, we're not sure when the post-coronavirus world will emerge or what, what that's even going to look like, unfortunately. Luckily, every, every state in the union has some sort of reopening comeback plan in play, but I think we can all agree that the, the, the final stanza has, has not been played out on this. With that said, and you can see this starting already, certain essential industries will be nearshored back to the US. We've all heard the stories, we've all been to the supermarket, whether it's PPE, pharma, medical equipment, those essential industries will and honestly should come back. Um, I've been a licensed customs broker in the United States for 30 plus years. I pay attention to this stuff. And in general, and especially as it relates to PPE, we became over-reliant, just, not just on China, but on other countries too. The rubber of the, the, the surgery grade gloves that, that, that are used in surgery, Thailand, believe it or not, huge supplier to the United States for surgical gloves and, and some of the more disposable things that are used in day surgery or more extensive surgery. So China, yeah, we definitely had an over-reliance there, but it's not just them. So we'll see those coming back. Other industries were already and continue to explore the feasibility of nearshoring, especially on high-end manufacturing. Some of the more labor-intensive stuff, we talked about wearing apparel and footwear. The bottom line is, because of the labor structure, justifiably so in the United States, is such that it's unlikely we'll, we'll be able to compete in wearing apparel and footwear. That's been going on for 40 plus years. But the high-end manufacturing, highly sophisticated products with really skilled technicians that go into making them here in the United States, really good manufacturing jobs, that's been going on and it will continue to do so. And, and I hope it does. Second to the last slide, I believe. Trade with China will continue, but at a slower pace for all the reasons we talked about. Coronavirus, kind of a if you're into boxing and you understand the terminology standing eight count, coronavirus standing eight count for China. They didn't get knocked out, but they got their bell rung pretty good and exposed some things that, that we as Americans and as business people need to need to learn from. But in general, because of increased costs in China, the Trump Section 301 tariffs come along, and now the, the realization of the American public of our over-reliance on China, China isn't going anywhere. Second largest economy in the world at 14 and a half trillion. The U.S. is still number one. But what you'll see, and this kind of wraps up the conversation, Chinese factories, they'll continue to move westward inland to those Chongqing, Chengdu, Wuhan, to, to use a name that, that uh, has some notoriety these days, which the labor costs might go down temporarily, but they will go up eventually. And if you go from a Shanghai to a Chongqing, you're looking at a couple thousand miles. 
So the additional time, the additional expense for inland freight, China will continue to compete. They're not going anywhere, trust me. But the opportunity to do business in other places like Mexico are, are vast and they should be pursued. Sourcing in Southeast Asia will grow as the China One Plus strategy. U.S. companies, I hope, will make greater use of America's 20 free trade agreements. And Mexico, they're already number one or number two. The, the door is open for, for continued growth of trade between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. And I think that will be accelerated in coming, in coming months. This is the final slide. So on behalf of Pegasus, and I'm, I'm, I'm not hanging up yet, so just wait. I just want to be sure and say thank you for taking the time to participate. Thank you for allowing me to go over six minutes and for indulging because I can see that the vast majority of people are still online. On, on behalf of Pegasus Logistics Group, thank you very much. Most importantly, stay safe. And let's see if we have any other questions here. Just one sec, please. What is your perspective? All right, we have some good ones, hold on. <clears throat> What is your perspective on CTPAT versus Basque certifications? Wow, with respect to doing business in Mexico from a supplier or manufacturer perspective. Well, this, this is a great one, and thank you for asking it. So uh, quite a bit of the work that I do in Mexico has, is related to supply chain security. That last trip that I mentioned to San Luis Potosí, it was actually a, a three-day conference on supply chain security. And for a gringo from Boston, Massachusetts, my part was one and a half days. But for a gringo from Boston, Massachusetts, who, who has a bad enough accent in English to speak Spanish for a day and a half at a supply chain security conference with 300 people there, that was, that was testing my linguistic skills. Why do I bring that up? Because we talked about CTPAT, the Customs and Trade Partnership Against Terror, versus Basque. Now, Basque is the Business Alliance, help me out with the, the acronym here for supply chain, it's a security organization. Now, perspective, if you look closely, and, and I actually, they're in Spanish. I have a bunch of slides on this. If, if you're interested, I'm more than happy to share them with people, is CTPAT, obviously, a U.S. government thing, whereas BASC is an organization. But if you look closely at the Policies and suggested, proce suggested procedures that CTPAT requires for a CTPAT cert versus a Basque, they're 85 to 90% the same thing. And it's about people, process, physical plant, technology, working with third parties. So if, my, my answer would be, if you can do both because CTPAT is voluntary, Basque, you have to pay to be a member and you have to go through the certification process and all that business. If you can do both, all the better. But if you superimpose the juxtaposition of the methodology used by Basque versus CTPAT, 85% the same. That's a great question. Thank you for, for asking it. What else do we have here? Hello, Daniel. Do you have any list or contacts for sourcing in Mexico? Well, that, that would depend. Um, on what the industry is. But yeah, I've been around for for quite some time in Mexico. You, you can, through Pegasus, I would be happy to discuss that. When moving trucks between Mexico and the U.S., what is the most common practice cross-stocking the cargo off the trailer and onto another or crossing the trailer itself? So it's a 50, if it's a, as we mentioned previously, a 53-footer, <clears throat> one shipper, one consignee, leave it in the trail, leave it in the trailer. Uh, you'll switch the power unit at the at the border. Now, LTL obviously is a little bit different because you have multiple shippers, multiple consignees that have to go through a customs clearance process, et cetera. So that's a little bit different. But the idea is to switch whenever you can switch the power unit, not the trailer, because that obviously would require more physical handling of the cargo. What else? This is really good. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, how to deal with logistical security issues in Mexico, especially transportation, susceptibility to theft. I would recommend that even if you, you don't have CTPAT certification or a member of BASC, if you look hard enough online, 
you can find the methodologies that these organizations use and create your own kind of homemade security program. But again, you have to be looking at people, access to information, the processes themselves, flow of documentation, physical plant, meaning warehouses, factories, access points, establishing a perimeter like they do in the military with a fence, a guard shack, all of those things. So I would suggest if you're a U.S. company to get engaged with CTPAT, if you have the financial wherewithal, join one of these organizations. And it's not just BASC. There's another one that I actually did a certification through. It's called ASIS, the American Society for Industrial Security. Go online, Google these entities. And if you look hard enough, you can find their methodology and you can start implementing those methodologies on an on, on a innovative basis, let's say. If you can join those organizations, all the better. But just remember, like in the banking industry, they call it KYC, know your customer. In our business, know your customer, know your supplier, know your 3PL, know everybody. Because anywhere in the world, when you're talking with susceptibility to theft, my experience has been dealing with this stuff a lot in places like Brazil and Colombia and certainly Mexico. It's almost always an inside job. Let's see what else we have. Oh, we have some, some opinion. That's excellent. With U.S. capacity issues in Mexico for northbound, you gain better rates and additional capacity transloading. Fair statement and, and a good one to make. And it's this is the type of thing that we like on these webinars where, where people participate, they challenge, they question, because there's a higher supply chain truth out there. I know that sounds a little corny, but I, I deeply believe that when Someone will make a statement. Someone will counter and say, hey, what about this? What about that? This is an excellent example of that. Let me read it again so people hear it. And this is a gentleman's opinion. With U.S. capacity issues in Mexico for northbound, you gain better rates and additional capacity transloading. Excellent observation. Thank you for making that. What else? All right. I think that might be it. Now, Hiram, would you like to make a, a closing a closing comment? Or Dennis? Uh, yeah, sure. So um well very well done, Dan. Your wealth of knowledge and your um you keep it entertaining. So I really appreciate you uh, kind of starting off our webinar series, which is awesome. Um no, I mean I think a couple things that kind of stick out to me, right? Dennis said at the beginning, knowledge sharing. So, you know, you can look at the pandemic as a uh, as a, uh, a sore spot for everybody, or you can look at it as an opportunity um, and how can we take advantage of learning together, right? And that's kind of what this is, has created. Um, you know, I chuckle if you get inbound logistics, um, there was a quote by the editor that said, now they know. Um, and the now you know was his three-year-old um, grandson says supply chain. So <laughs> never in the history of the world has supply chain been so um, elevated through every management magazine you read today beyond logistics um, on how to deal with with a pandemic, it's been exposed and disruption has never been more unprecedented, right? So uh, we thought this was a good idea to get to get Dan on and, and talk about Mexico as we know that people are looking for, for new options to source. So um, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to um, anybody on our team. And we just really appreciate everybody's attendance and um, love the questions at the end as well. Absolutely. I'm, I'm flattered that you had me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right on. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.